A pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater. Hi, I'm Father Andrew Miller. And I'm Pastor Michelle Byerly. And this is A Pastor and a Priest Walk Into a Movie Theater, a podcast about faith, life, and the silver screen. Today we'll be discussing the Matrix Trilogy. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Matrix Trilogy, it is a series of um, sci-fi that poses some really interesting questions about the nature of reality. It has the wonderful Keanu Reeves. And part of why we're doing it is because there will be a fourth in the series that will be coming out really soon. Pretty so sure. has it did come out? Um, like I think you might be able to stream it now. Could be. So either way, we uh, wanted to have this conversation, and I am excited to welcome one of my colleagues from the Great Plains Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, the Reverend Michael Brown, um, who I had the chance to get to know on a trip to Israel, among other things, and it's been a real pleasure to get to know him as a colleague. Michael, would you like to share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, Like uh, Michelle said, I'm a uh, pastor in the Great Plains Annual Conference, the United Methodist Church, um, fully ordained uh, elder here. I uh, serve in eastern Nebraska, so uh, kind of a, well, it, it's a small town, but it's bigger than than any town I've served in yet, so, you know, <laughs> has that going for it, so, yeah. yeah, I'm excited to be here. So why The Matrix for you? Well, I, The Matrix, like, it has a lot of uh, themes surrounding it and the themes woven into it that are not um, not overly subtle uh, and they get less subtle as we go along um, that are are very biblically uh, pertinent you know, normally when I watch a movie I'm, I'm trying to find the the scriptural you know things in it um, I, I like to begin with you know this probably wasn't the author's direct intent, but you know, we live in in a world that is so filled with God, you know, that, that you know, God's omnipresence within it. That, frankly, any story you tell is gonna, going to have elements that we can find of of God's story in it, because God is everywhere in our in our lives, and and what we know to tell is going to include God. I know I don't get that from the Matrix. There's, especially as we get into two and three, like, I kind of feel like that's exactly what the Wachowskis were going for here. Um, and so uh, I, I like to talk about it and it's, it's rated R. So it's a lot harder for some of my, my congregants to have seen it <laughs> because there's just that, that hard rating. Um, and there's some elements in it that, that are going to make uh, some of my parishioners squeam a little bit, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's so packed full of, of themes. Um, biblical themes that that it, it's fun to talk about yeah so it, it's funny um i got my mom's permission to tell this story my introduction to the matrix i well there's two stories with it the first one is we were watching it and my mom to this day cannot watch any of them because she watched just enough to that first part where they were putting the bug into his stomach and she just couldn't do it after that and then the other story that i remember is because it was r-rated and i was like 15 or 16 at the time my brother and i wanted to go see one of the sequels i forget what whether it was um two or three and uh they wouldn't let us in (laughs) without parental permission and so my mom had to come and let us go to see it but she did which i was kind of um, my my folks were pretty relaxed like that. Um, you know, for a while it was we had to watch with them. And then kind of once my brother turned 17, it was kind of hard to keep me from watching our rated movies. So, you know, I was the young, precocious child. <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, the biblical themes and the Matrix yeah. are yeah, pretty clear and pretty uh, intentional. Uh, yeah. uh, on the other hand, um, uh, well... No, there is no other hand there. I'm curious what what theme would you would you would like us to discuss first, uh, uh, Reverend Brown? Well, I, I kind of was thinking about that as as a parent for this. Like, I think that one and two lean heavily into one theme, and three leans heavily into another theme. 
Um, but then it three pulls pulls the first theme back in right at the end. And, and the theme that that kind of goes across them all there, the one and two is to me was the uh, question and the conflict between uh, predestination and choice, uh, predestination and free will. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Calvinism versus Arminianism, as we can pull in Wesley if he really wants to, but, um, <laughs> but, we'll uh, you know, the, pull in the, Wesley. always, um, you know, <laughs> Methodists are, are Arminianists, meaning that we believe that, that everyone has free will, at least to some degree, and that, uh, you know, that, that things aren't predestined. And in particular, we don't believe in things like fate to the level that, that the movie does at least, uh, mm -hmm. or at least to the level that, that Smith does uh, in the movie. And so, um, you know, kind of looking at that, and I don't really know exactly which way the Wachowskis came down. They, they presented the fight, but there were good and bad sides, parts of both sides. And I think they intentionally like left it ambiguous, choice, but yeah, everyone made their choice, but <laughs> um, kind of went with the prophecies and they all came true. And, and so there was an element of fate to, to everyone you're choosing to, to, I don't know, choosing to do what was predestined or something like that. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, the, like that was front and center. Well, I, I have an idea about about that. So, um, uh, I, 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 of course, the biblical themes in the film are, are quite pregnant. However, I, I think ultimately the theology is not exactly orthodox in the historic sense of the term. It, I, it's 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 Gnostic um, in in the sense of uh, well, I mean, it's 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 based on the tradition of Gnosticism, and uh, you know, there's a lot going on with the tradition of Gnosticism concerning the um, uh, nature of reality as either illusory or created by a false demi demigod who i think the architect really plays the role of in the second film but uh, and to lesser extent the oracle um but um the uh what was i going to say the um power that one has over fate is knowledge in us in, in 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 most forms of gnosticism and i think that uh the 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 freedom that uh, in the first film really emphasizes this and i think it comes to be questioned uh to a large extent in the second and third films uh but the freedom that one has over the the slavery of the system is to understand it and to um choose to uh transcend it so and of course whether that that choice is is fated or free in a libertarian sense, it's still freeing in the sense that it, 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 the, 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 the chooser experiences it as, as freedom. So. Which is really interesting because that's Cypher's whole issue in the first movie is he doesn't feel like the free choice was really all that free to him. You know, he feels like he wasn't given all of the information to have made the decision and it's kind of one of those decisions that once you know something you can't go back and that was his whole gripe and that's why he does what he does at the end of the first movie cypher is interesting because i think he's honestly redeemed in the third film in a very real interest in in much the way as gnostic literature tries to redeem the judish the judas character uh cypher i think um, his his idea about the matrix is actually in, so, somewhat validated because the third film gives the the resolution as i read it is is that it gives the human beings who are still plugged into the matrix the choice to whether or not they want to remain plugged into the matrix or go to the human society outside of the matrix however i i, I think at the end of the day cyrus's question of why is the matrix less real than the quote unquote real world is an exceedingly valid one, right? I, especially if we follow you know, philosophers like Descartes or, or, or um, uh, uh, George Berkeley or, or others, and we can get into them. But um, <clears throat> the, the idea of uh, why is it that being unplugged from this computer system makes your experience outside of the computer system more real? And ultimately, um, as long as human beings have the choice, understand the implications of what it is they're doing, uh, perhaps even frame it in, a, in an ethical sense of, well, you're actually helping these machines, your uh, brother, sister, um, uh, uh, persons to survive, then at the end of the day, the, the, the different worlds become kind of ethically equalized 
in that sense to where it's really six in one half dozen in the other is from an ethical perspective as to whether you choose to be plugged into the matrix because it's more pleasant or more actually it isn't necessarily more pleasant um versus um uh refusing to be plugged into the matrix because it's more quote-unquote authentic whatever that means i think the cypher character is really vindicated at the end of the day Yeah. Yeah, I th I think that that there's a lot of truth to what you're you're saying there particularly around the uh the gnostic, you know, knowledge uh based ideas behind what they were what they were saying um you know re repeated in almost every movie is you don't you can't see past the choices you don't understand. Um that that even stops the oracle. Um, I I wasn't watching with gnostic thoughts in the back of my mind. Um but uh, yeah, like one thing that I was was seeing was that I, I what I want to see, and I know this isn't the movie that that uh, that's coming coming uh, at the end of December. But uh, what I want to see is is prequels. I want to see you know previous incarnations of the one, because what I want to know is did the oracle was the oracle able to see the future, or does this just always happen with the same beats? Uh, you know, every time the one comes back, is it always the same beats? And where that would be going to is is when you are talking amongst Armenians, there's the question of, of God's omniscience. Uh, and, you know, does God know and is God all knowing in the sense of God is outside of time and so therefore is able to see the entire you know, time stream? So you're making your choice in the now. But God, outside of time, knows what your choice is because God can look three seconds into the future. Or does God just know you and know what choice you're going to make um, because God knows us so well, better than we know ourselves, and so therefore, um, therefore is knowing of what we're going to do and knowing what every choice that's being made on the planet is probably going to be, but you know, doesn't necessarily know the future a million years into the future. Is well, and it's funny that you talk about know yourself because that's a pretty big theme in the first movie as Neo is trying to decide, am I the one, am I not? And it's not until he claims that identity for himself that he really becomes it, you know? And so I think I, of those two that you're describing, I think it's probably more the, the latter where God just knows who we are as people. There's a Christian philosopher named Boethius, early Middle Ages, who uh, uh, asks some interesting questions that I think wrote, throw some wrenches into Arminian theology. In, of course, this is pre-Arminian theology by about a um, uh, thousand years. Um, but uh, uh, the, um, the gist of it is, is uh, uh, simple foreknowledge for Boethius doesn't work. Um, and uh, because it, it's, it's still a fading mechanism, right? Even if God um, uh, knows exactly what you're going to do, uh, even if you still choose it, uh, the only fading mechanism is God's foreknowledge. That's still a fading mechanism, at which point um, you don't have free will in the libertarian sense of the term. Because the, and, and to define libertarian free will, uh, it means the ability to act otherwise, the ability to freely choose to buck fake, fading mechanisms. So it's often set up against um, uh, uh, causal determinism, the idea that uh, you are causally determined to act in a certain way uh, uh, to say that you have free will in a libertarian sense is no, no, no. You have the ability to freely choose to buck chains of causal determinants. Um, or any other fading mechanism. Well, Boethius would say, no, 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 no. The foreknowledge of God is still a fading mechanism. What that means is you don't have free will. Um, so Boethius then proposes what you were talking about, uh, Pastor Brown, the idea that God being outside of time doesn't foreknow in a um, simplistic sense, um, but being outside of time, all time occurs as if it were in one moment. Now, my problem with Boethius is, is that that's still a fading mechanism. <laughs> so that doesn't get around the problem in the way he wants it to. And then there was another philosopher who came along by the name of uh, Molinus, who was a Jesuit, who argued that God doesn't possess 
um, uh, uh, simple foreknowledge, but rather possesses what he calls middle knowledge. In other words, God possesses knowledge of, uh, and I'm going to use some jargon term here, counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. In other words, God knows it, God knows um, the all possible outcomes of all possible choices that uh, the free creature would make, but it's ultimately the, the 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 free creature who chooses, and then God knows the outcomes of the choice that that he will choose. Even I don't. I, that that still doesn't get past the problem, though, uh, O Molinist. That doesn't solve it. It's still a fading mechanism at the end of the day. And and we could propose. I mean, the closest that we could come is another uh, option that you talked about, Pastor Brown, of, of of relational knowledge. We under and I I tend to lean towards this that God's omniscience is relational, not factual. Um, that God is like knows the self perfectly, and thus has a, a, a as perfect a predictive power as possible. But it's still a fading knowledge if we say that that uh, that that perfect relational knowledge allows for perfect predictive power. So, and and if, 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 if as long as there is any fading mechanism, then the only way for us to really have free will in any authentic sense is to redefine free will uh in such a way whereby it isn't libertarian well and i think what we're running into is why the architect takes the view he does where he's very much determinism cause effect cause effect you know so. that's the merovingian right yeah the merovingian <laughs> but but the architect has you know the architect is right. is mathematical you know, that everything boils down to an equation and everyone plays their part in the equation and everything has to equal out. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, the architects like, and the, the crazy thing is, is emotion gets in the way, right? You know, the emotion is what unbalances the equation. Um, you know, Which is why there. the Oracle is created to understand human psychology is kind of my understanding of why the Oracle is then created to understand that component. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's really interesting. What do you make of the fact that Agent Smith in the first movie, he in talking to Morpheus, he he's describing the construction of the Matrix and he's talking about earlier versions of it. And he says, you know, the first one was this utopia and everything was perfect and there was no suffering and all of that. But the human mind couldn't accept it. What do you guys make of that? Interesting critique of socialism. Say more. Okay. Well, I mean, at least in a in a in a Marxian sense, and uh, well, of course, Marx tried to uh, sidestep this idea. Well, I should say, Engels tried to claim that Marx tried to sidestep this sense of being utopian, um, but I don't think he succeeds. Because at, at, at the end of the day, Marx's vision of socialism is still that uh, human beings find s fulfillment in their labor because it's their labor of their choice and it's their labor that accords um, so perfectly with their talents that, you know, you can be a, a, a candle maker at, at, at dawn, uh, a, a cobbler at noon, and then do some critiquing in, at, at, at three in the afternoon, right? You're not, you're not bound by this sense of schedule. Uh, this gets into some um, early Marxist philosophy that uh, we probably don't have time for. But um, when you, you set up the Marxist system of dialectics, it's very, very unclear as to how that all equates, how that how, how, how dialectical materialism really all resolves into that. And furthermore, um, I'm not if we buy Agent Smith's view, um, then I'm not sure that that communist society as Marx and by the way, full disclosure, I am a Marxist. So this is a friendly critique of Marxism. Um, I'm not sure that that communist society of Marx is even desirable, but just take it a step further. Uh, I think it's more a critique of the kingdom of heaven per se, or of naive ideas of the kingdom of heaven as a perfect society. Uh, uh, and it, it seems to me that, and even I would endorse this as a Catholic priest, it seems to me that uh, while there may not be suffering in the kingdom of heaven, there must be room for pain in the kingdom of heaven and growth and struggle and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's just we remove the suffering from it, the festering of it. It's, it. Pain becomes a joy. It becomes like something that challenges us to move forward rather than something that we suffer because of. Anyway. 
And if we're ascribing, you know, complete and total, like that the Wachowskis were only inspired by the Bible, which I, I'm sure that they weren't, um, you know, the first edition of, of creation in the Bible was a paradise, was the first mm-hmm. thing. And the first thing they do is they reject it, right? There, there's mm-hmm. one thing you can't do, just anything else. And there's one thing you can't do. And, and we just run right to that one thing that we, we can't do. Um, yeah. You know, back to the, the discussion of choice, um, you know, one of the reasons, not one of, the reason I'm still a Methodist um, is I, you know, frustrated with, with how our church has, has gone within its internal politics in the last several uh, years. But the reason I'm still a Methodist is that in my darkest hour with, with my denomination was the same year I was learning about John Wesley. And, you know, I just, I fell in love with, with what he was writing, with what his theology was. One of the big things that I liked about him was his, you know, kind of uh, statement on free will, which was that if you don't have the ability to choose incorrectly, then you don't have free will. That like, and then that's kind of informed a lot of my theology on on that is God has a plan. God has, you know, a desire, a, a way for us to go, but we can thwart that. Um, and maybe God knows that we're going to, maybe God doesn't. But, but we can thwart that because if we can't choose wrong, we can't, we, we don't have free will. And I think in, in the matrix idea, like that's the 1% that doesn't choose to be there. You can make an argument that this is not overly a prison. Um, the, the matrix is not overly a prison. This is the machines need us for power and, and, you know, they're powering themselves, but they're, it's not torture you know, to be in the matrix, it's life as humans. And, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, real life that as we would experience it as the viewer. Um, and so you could make a case that the incorrect art, the re- incorrect choice is to leave the matrix. And I think that's where you, you were going for with, with Cypher. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. that is not, you know, there's no sunlight, there's no sunrises, there's no sunset, there's no your animals, you have to go down, <laughs> way, way, way down just to be able to survive outside of your ship. Um, you know, it's far less, it's far more dystopian and far less good to be out. Um, you know, maybe there, there's a sense of, you know, a real life to it. Okay. But, mm-hmm. um, but you can make that case, but yeah, but, um, and then on the other hand, <laughs> you know, is there a back to Egypt committee that wants to, that, that says, you know, at least in the matrix, we didn't have this world and yet part of free of getting out of Egypt was that they are free then, you know, is it, is it better to live as a slave or is it better to live? You know, so it, it's that devil. That's the other side of it, <laughs> you know, you know, there's a, um, on, on, I, I think um, one of the things that, uh, that turned me into an Arminian and uh, um, uh, in spite of not being a Methodist, a, uh, closeted Wesleyan um, uh, was um, and it's not so much Saint yes Saint John Wesley's theology per se on the matter as when when I set up um, <clears throat> um, Arminianism versus Calvinism uh, and that's a, that's a little simplistic the predestinarianism versus uh, free will based theology it's not that I'm attracted to free will in a in a naive sense. Because I, I question really whether we have free will uh, in, a, in, a, in a libertarian sense. Right. But what I agree, where I, where I go with the free will advocates is that one has to understand our relationship with God in such a way whereby we are persons, not cogs. Um, because if we're cogs in a machine, then we don't relate to God in any meaningful sense. Right. Um, and, and there has to be, however we define it, and I'm not sure how to define it in any meaningful sense, there has to be free will, the ability to buck God's plan, as you were saying, Pastor Brown, um, in, in order for that to be true. Um, so if we set up a, and I, and I understand the advantages of, of five-point Calvinism, um, and from the Catholic perspective, Jansenism or, or, or radical Augustinianism. I understand those advantages and I actually endorse some of them, but um, the, the, the simple fact is, is that we're, we're cogs in a machine. 
Um, and actually, a lot of a lot of Calvinists would say, "Well, yeah, that's the point. Where God is sovereign and we are not." And my response is, "Is all right that I, I hear you and I hear your piety in that statement, but the point is, is, we don't relate to God as persons. If we don't relate to God as persons, we don't relate to God at all. If we're just, you know, that that's that's not a relationship worth having." So, going back to uh, Smith, um, you know, Agent Smith is to me at least, is, is without a doubt an Antichrist character in yes. uh, two and three, uh, which knowing that, like I hadn't seen the first one in a long time before watching this uh, to, to get back here. I saw the third one only once <laughs> before watching it for this. But um, like I, I knew that, that Agent Smith was this Antichrist figure in the, in the next two. So watching the first one with that in mind, um, I saw a lot of, of a, a fall from heaven type story in what he was doing, particularly, you know, the, the choice to take the, the earpiece out, to disconnect from the system and, and his sitting here, like, just questioning, like, why am I doing this? Why, what is going on here? Why, why is, is this happening? And, and uh, what is going on? And who are the humans? Um, you know, the, their viruses on, on the earth and, and his his you know questioning and, and seeking for knowledge falls away from from the system, um, you know falls away from from God and in, in you know the full analogy, um, which I, I think the Wachowskis would ultimately say that no that's not you know that's not what happens if you if you question if you doubt you don't you know fall away from God but um, but doing this analogy that would be that's what starts Smith's fall is is uh you know he, he's questioning why the system is going he's, he's trying to figure out um why fate why it is fated this way right if if this is fate then why this way it's, it's a problem of theodicy uh for smith and it it starts a fall that that will lead him to uh trying to fix it and uh trying to fix it leads to all the problems i i found the the confrontation in in two between Smith and and, uh, and and Neo very fascinating because I hear in Smith's philosophy a lot of Jean-Paul Sartre um, in, in, in the following sense. Um, Smith thanks Neo for freeing him and then mm -hmm. essentially goes on to lambast freedom as some kind of condemnation. Jean-Paul Sartre says we are condemned to be free. Right, we often think of freedom and free will as if it's this wonderful thing, but actually, it's condemnation. And 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 Smith is in many respects an existentialist and a nihilist. And it's like uh, the the very very thing that you're seeking, humans, is your condemnation. You're, it's 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 evil. And I, I really enjoy Smith's character because of that criticism that he really levels against uh, the 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 protagonists of the film. Smith Smith is great. <laughs> There, there, I had a question for you, um, Pastor Michelle, and um, and and you, um, uh, Pastor Ron, because of uh, of uh, well, uh, the Wesleyanism, <clears throat> um, either in the film or that that we're reading into the film, either way is valid. Um, where do you see? And, and you mentioned this in in, in our conversations on the on, on the uh, in our text conversations, uh, Pastor mm. Michelle. Where do you see provenient grace? Well, it's the fact that there are people who are already searching for Neo before he even realizes it. It's that um, I often describe provenient grace as that, like that itch that something more is going on. And we see that right from the beginning with Neo where, um, you know, he, he knows something isn't quite right, you know? And, and so that's what is leading him to seek and to find out what the matrix is to find out more about what's going on. And that's where I see the provenient grace at work. How would you define provenient grace for the listener? So it's it's that grace that calls us towards God. I've I've heard there's a lot of metaphors for it. Um, there's God's wooing, you know, and and it sometimes I've heard it as that God shaped hole in us. I don't know how I feel about that because it implies somehow that we're incomplete. But uh, I think, it, like I said, it's that it's that thing that calls us towards something more in our lives that says there's more to our existence than just what we can see taste touch hear feel experience there's god more gives to us, it god gives us the question 
God, yeah. God's great God graciously gives us the questions to ask, and it's that giving of the questions yeah. that leads us to God. And and it's that God has already loved us before we even could understand and know God. You know, and that's a, a really comforting thing to think about that God loves yeah. us before we even realize it. And and when I talk about it with my congregants, I lean far more into it's the actions that God's doing before you even knew you needed God. Yeah. Right. It's the, it's the, it's Trinity, you know, reaching out to Neo before he even knew he was questioning what was going on. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, the Oracle's actions to Morpheus, you know, decades before, you know, probably before Neo was even born or maybe as Neo was being born, uh, you know, like that kind of stuff is, uh, is what I lean into in terms of provenient grace. It's, it's what God is doing in your life before you even know to ask. One thing I was thinking about, like, as I was, was logging in <laughs> today is that if I'm drawing all these analogies between, you know, Neo being a Christ figure and, and Smith being an antichrist was okay. Well, what, where is John the Baptist? Um, and I don't, I don't think I find a John the Baptist. I find a Daniel. Um, and I think that naming the ship the Nebuchadnezzar helps with that a little bit. It points me toward that story uh, yes. where, where Morpheus is not John the Baptist, you know, crying in the wilderness to prepare the way. Morpheus is Daniel predicting, you know, predicting the end times. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we can, I don't, I don't think we have time to get into uh, uh, time or space to get into whether Daniel's predicting the end times or not. <laughs> and, and yeah. uh, you know, the, the uh, literature of, of an apocalypse, but but to me, that's what Morpheus is, is really doing is, is he's sitting there, you know, like there will be a beast and there will be, you know, 10 horns or whatever. And, and, you know, everyone in Zion's going, you're crazy, dude. Um, but uh, that to me was, was where that is. And, and I do like the, the ship's names point so much to what they're supposed to be. You know, the, the Nebuchadnezzar, the Logos, the Mjolnir. Um, I had to look them up <laughs> as I was watching the third movie. Um, you know, that's exactly what they do, right? It's a prophecy of, of the end, a prophecy of, of the the coming of the end uh, from the Nebuchadnezzar, the Logos is taking Christ to where he needs to be. And um, the Mjolnir is a hammer coming in to hit, hit the machines at the end. So, Our Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign, New Year, New Faith, New Media, continues and we are doing very well. As of Monday, January 24th, we were 59% funded with $290 and 40 days to go. Our goal is to get our own website where we can have a digital home base independent of Facebook and other social media platforms. We'll have the archives of all of our episodes, as well as discussion forums, ways to sign up for mailing lists, and all sorts of other cool stuff. Rewards for donating include line-drawn portraits from Editor Wesley, lifelong membership in the New Faith New Media Minecraft server, and even picking a movie for a pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater and joining us for the discussion. If you're at all interested in donating or even just finding out more about how to help us in other ways, please check out the campaign at bit.ly slash nfnmindie. The link will also be in the show notes. I, I, I also I, I like in to to discuss at some point the theology in the more abstract sense of the film. Like so, for instance, um, it's it, I think it's Gnostic, but I also think, oddly enough, for Gnosticism, which generally has a very very high even Docetic uh, Christology, um, yeah, this has a very low Christology. Like Neo as a Christ figure, even if we want to call him a Christ figure, is not. Um, a Christ figure in the um, I, in either the super high docetic uh, God and not human uh, mm -hmm. sense or the orthodox uh, God and human sense. He's very, very human. Um, and it, it's almost even adoptionist, although I don't know if there's a God in the film, um, but it's almost adoptionist in the sense that he becomes the Christ figure as he chooses to become. The and almost in the sense that anyone could become that, you know, there's almost that sense to which, and that's where we get into the heretical almost. 
Yes, because at the end of the day, the well, it'd be I heretical read... if you adopt the belief. It's well, not yeah. necessarily, you know, the Wachowskis can be heretical all they want. They're not pastors. Sure. No, <laughs> it, 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 but I, I honestly th- saw that, that, you know, the the key to, to, to bending the spoon is, is to recognize the there truth. There is no spoon. There is no spoon. The key to stopping the bullets is to recognize the truth. There are no bullets. The bullets are computerized animations. In principle, anyone could do that. Neo, and this is how I read it, maybe I'm reading it wrong, Neo is the one, because Neo is the one who is sort of allowed to be able to do that more easily, and I wonder if that's because, and and, and I see in this kind of the repetition, and and by the way, we should talk about Origen, the um, um, uh, Christian philosopher Origen, who who understands the cycle of sin, redemption, salvation, and damnation as as an endless round as well. Uh, but but and maybe this is the incarnational bit, although it's still pretty low church, is that. Uh, Neo is, in a sense, kind of a both a human and not exactly a machine, but sort of has machine elements, the the ability to kind of relate to machines in a in a, in a unique way, so as to he see can that function the in the way that the machine can function. So as to yeah. see that the bullets are 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 not real, and to and yeah, you're right, as to and and can fly and and do all of these things to manipulate the matrix. Real quick, it, it does have a very low Christology, and I I haven't seen the fourth film yet. And I'm afraid they're going to maybe undo this a little bit if it is a continuation. But he doesn't re- he doesn't resurrect right at the end of the end of three. He's crucified. You know that that light is literally a cross. You know coming mm-hmm. on him yeah. in that shape, but he doesn't resurrect. But um, the next movie I, is I, I called like that about the trilogy. I, I don't know if that's going to do that. Well, There's... and the funny thing is, the next movie is called Matrix Resurrection. Yeah. <laughs> um, so on the atonement. Um, I, I, I wanted to, it, it made me think of my favorite, um, and I read this every every Easter, my favorite um, Paschal homily by St. John Chrysostom. Um, and I, I'd like to, to, to read it here real quick, just bits and pieces, it won't take long. Enjoy ye all the feast of faith, receive ye all the riches of the loving, of loving kindness. Let no one bewail his poverty for the universal kingdom has been revealed. Let no one weep for their iniquities, for pardon has shone forth from the grave. Let no one fear death, for the Savior's death has set us all free. He that was held prisoner of it has annihilated it. By descending into hell, he took hell captive. He embittered it when it tasted his flesh. And Isaiah, foretelling this, did cry, Hell, he said, was embittered when it encountered thee in the lower regions. It was embittered, for it was abolished. It was embittered, for it was mocked. It was embittered, for it was slain. It was embittered, for it was overthrown. It was embittered, for it was fettered in chains. It took a body and met God face to face. It took earth and encountered heaven. It took that which was seen and fell upon the unseen. And that, to, that, that, that to me, that sense of, 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 of God or the savior, in this case, we talk about how there's a low Christology of the matrix, but the, the, the sense in which matrix, um, the salvation of the matrix and of the non-matrix occurs because Neo allows himself to apparently be assimilated by uh, 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 Smith. And in so doing, Smith, by assimilating Neo, seals his own fate and destroys himself in much the same way as hell, uh, the imperial powers that be by crucifying Jesus ultimately seal their own fate because they take upon themselves that which is their contradiction. So. Yeah, yeah my... My personal favorite theory of atonement by far is the Christus Victor theory of atonement um, that, you know, basically it, it doesn't have any of the, uh, the substitutionary stuff in it. You know, God, God, Christ became human because he had to die. He had to go to, to hell to fight the battle. <laughs> that, that's pretty much it. Uh, when you're just looking at Christian Victor is, is he had to fight the battle and that was the only way to get to the battle. And so in that sense, yeah, you know, the devil seals his fate 
<laughs> by inviting the inviting the battle by killing Jesus. And victory is if you're, found if you're in giving the devil defeat. power over power over Caiaphas like that. Well, and it's so fascinating that you know, as you guys are talking about this, I realize Neo literally goes to the center of the machine world to do this. You know, yeah. so, so that's he literally. In- literally descends into hell <laughs> but that's another part that's interesting and and i was thinking about this as i as we were as i was uh, uh uploading the first part um is the are the mach- is the machine hell or is the machine god and i'm not entirely mm. sure because at, at the end of the day at, at... i i read the architect to be god at the very least, be like architect, oracle, and, and maybe there's another one. Maybe Neo, uh, you know, the, the that form the of anomaly, holy trinity, the anomaly being a, a kind of holy trinity. Granted, that metaphor falls very quickly because it it isn't the the type of god that that most Christians would would go with. But again, the Wachowskis are not telling a, a sermon, um, so well, they're they're free to do what they want in that sense. That's to me where, where, if I was assigning a god to it, it would be the controllers of the matrix, the, the mm. programs that control the matrix. Um, you know, the architect, the oracle, the the even to some sense the agents, although they're kind of more angelic slash demon, depending on which mm. way you're you're giving them in the in the moment. But that yeah, to me I, was where I was attributing God. And yeah, the the machines are there, but but I'm not really sure what that big machine at the the end really was. Well, it's interesting. I, I think the architect um, is, is, takes on a kind of father, a God the Father type figure in, in the false way in which uh, folks often, I think, misunderstand the character of, of God the Father, God the Mother, in, in the sense yeah. that, and, and, and the way in which we, we, we call her him, call her father exclusively, <laughs> that, that harsh, logical father figure who's there to get it done. Right. And then you have, of course, the spirit, the the oracle, the one who's there to try and understand emotion. The, and that that's also a, a simplification of the role of spirit. And then, of course, yeah. the 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 neo, the one who the the, the, the one, the, the Christ, the, the logos who goes into the world of the humans and experiences it from 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 their perspective. Um, and and, and I, I, I guess I read the last scene as because because the, the human struggle for freedom and the naming of the ship Nebuchadnezzar uh, what if we take it a step further what if because uh, I actually initially thought of, of of Morpheus as John the Baptist and I love your analysis well maybe he's Daniel and then I, and I never could figure out why I would name the ship Nebuchadnezzar after the evil king what if he's Nebuchadnezzar what what if he's the rebel what if mm-hmm. what what if he's the he, he's the sinner right and ultimately the last scene, is 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 neo acting out the christ role of reconciling sinners to the machine sinners to god and ultimately part of the reconciliation is is well they have the choice to leave the matrix if they wish but that isn't necessarily the right choice it isn't the good choice it's not the choice that's going to lead you with um you know, animals and sunlight and all of that. And of course, then the existential philosopher might reply, well, well, well wait a minute, how, how but, but, but living outside the matrix is, is more authentic. Oh, is it? I mean, consider this, George Berkeley, and I'm sorry, I'm going down a tangent and I swear I, I, I won't take too long, but George Berkeley, the philosopher George Berkeley argues that there is no evidence whatsoever that there is any distinction between idea and reality. I mean, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but there's no evidence for it. If you take that seriously, then why is it that being plugged into the matrix is more or less authentic from an empirical perspective than, 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 than not being plugged into the matrix? It, 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 at the end of the day, Cypher is vindicated. Cypher isn't the Judas character. Cypher is the Gnostic character. Cypher is vindicated. The, the two worlds are at best equal in their ethical implications choosing to be uh, in, in, uh, uh, out of the matrix choosing to be in the matrix six and one from an ethical perspective at best it might even be better to be in the matrix from an ethical perspective because you're giving of yourself to sustain the machines and it, I, anyway yeah. yeah 
I mean, there's an argument to be made. It's actually more authentic to the true human experience to be in the matrix than it is to be in the real world because the real world, we scorch the sky. You, there is no sunrise. There is no sunset. Um, although admittedly, only the last scene has a sunrise that looks like the one they see when the ship goes over the clouds. You know, so the matrix sun was not, was not real uh, per, the, per the movie. It was much, much more colorful than the one we would know in our in our real life uh, here in the matrix, you know, so to speak. Um, but I, I would make an argument that, yeah, we have sunrises, we have sunsets, we have, you know, weather and they have an underground. They couldn't even get, they could barely get to the surface and they couldn't get to within a hundred you know, kilometers of, of the machine world. So. Okay. And the sunset, red sunsets, and you're right. And the sunrises and sunsets are all generated like images from a computer. All right. Well, the sunrises and sunsets that we have are all generated images from God. I mean, at the end of the day, there's or or they are developed in the biological computer that is our brain, because really, that's all our brains are is a biological computer. You know, and, and our experience is merely what we create, you know, which is, you know, like you say, Berkeley, Berkeley is right in that sense. And psychology is kind of leaning in that direction where the mind makes it real to quote <laughs> There's one more thing I'll say, and then I swear I'll shut up about all this. There's another <laughs> philosopher. Um, he's a political libertarian. Anyway, uh, if you're a libertarian, Pastor Brown, I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Or to, not. Uh, but uh, by the name of Robert Nozick, who proposes a thought experiment called Nozick's Experience Machine. Uh, this is before The Matrix, but it sounds very similar to The Matrix. Uh, and in fact, I bet the Wilkowski's probably drew from Robert Nozick. But anyway, uh, uh, so all right, so you can construct, uh, uh, and there's two steps to it, to the thought experiment. Step one, if, if we were to use a machine, a computer, to construct a perfect reality, would you enter that machine, right? To, to construct the experience of, of, a, of a perfect reality, right? Would you enter that machine? And well, the natural response of a lot of uh, folks is say, well, no, of course not, because I think pain and, 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 and suffering is, is, a, is, is an important integral part of existence, sort of that conversation that Smith has with Morpheus. Uh, okay, okay, says Nozick, fine, we can build that into the machine. We can build that into the experience machine. Now would you enter? And, 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 and all, the ultimate conclusion of the thought experiment is that it's six in one, half dozen in the other. There's no difference. There's no reason to enter the machine or to not enter the machine. It's, it's all six in one. So. We have a lot of you know, modern Facebook philosophers <laughs> type people who, who you know are you know constantly asking you know, is this just a simulation the 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 theory that you know if we ever did have a simulated universe that it's far more likely we're in a simulated universe than it is that we're in the first one um, because you know the simulated universes would simulate would simulate on down it, and the uh, the question is always like well if we are what does that matter you know, what is Dumbledore and what you does that ruin what you yeah yeah it's Dumbledore yeah does that really ruin what your your experience has been of course it's all in your head why shouldn't that make it real yeah yeah well and then it is I, interesting that you, you know we find out that this is not the first matrix this is like number six you know i what does that play into things does it, it, it to me that almost pulls in a little bit of the cycle of i mean we talked about it a little bit with the with some of the Christian philosophy, but then you get into even a little bit of Buddhist reincarnation and the cycle of life, death, rebirth, life again. Pastor Brown, have you seen Battlestar Galactica, the show, the new show, the 2003 show? I have not. I haven't seen New Oracle. Mm. I turned to Pastor Michelle. I, I, I showed Pastor Michelle a little bit about, I think you, you've watched what, the first or second, the first and second season, Michelle? Um, first episode, at least. Well, no, you. I, well, I, no, I, I turned to Michelle. I turned to Pastor Michelle after I saw the third film, and I said, "It's Battlestar Galactica. That's a, that's all it is. It's just that mm-hmm. the, the, they're the same darn story, uh, uh, minus the simula- sans the simulation in Battlestar. But uh, the <coughs> the idea is is that all right? So you, uh, the machines are the antithesis of of human beings, but the the salvation is found in synthesizing them. In, in, in creating a world in which they coexist and in which they build off of each other. And because uh, that is part of this whole story, too, is that 
ultimately one can't live without the other mm. you know they have to ultimately it takes neo working with the machines to get agent smith dealt with and the philosophy that ultimately is the anti-christian philosophy the philosophy that is the the, the destructive philosophy is the not is, is is not at the end of the day the the philosophy of of you know, is of either the matrix or the or, or or the free humans. It is the nihilist, the one who wants to deny the the ability of choice to make meaning out of seeming jumble. So, so another theme that I thought was particularly potent is this notion of love as a uniquely human experience, and yet. At the in the third movie, you have the the father and the little girl, and he says, you know, what can I do? I love her. <laughs> you know, that's why he's trying to get her out of the system, so to speak, because she has no use, and so the system clears out anything that doesn't have a use, which is a very capitalist, very <laughs> pragmatic thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, and 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 then we have you know Trinity's love for Neo in the first movie is kind of what saves him, you know. So and and then in the second movie they have basically the temple orgy we talked about, you know, where they're all expressing their love for one another and everyone's. And interestingly, with that one is they create a program without a purpose. They they created a program to create a program. Mm-hmm. We we yeah. have children to have children. Yeah, whereas it seems like the rest of the programs, yeah, there's new programs being created, but they're created with a purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, the Oracle talked about, you know, this program is created to do a previous program's job better. Um, you know, the, the agents get upgrades uh, in, in the second movie, whereas this was a very human emotion, if you will, of just wanting to wanting to procreate, wanting to see new life. Um you know, the, the little girl has no purpose, although she does, at the end, they claim that, that she creates the new sunset, so she's kind of, like, operating that way, but but uh, that's a very unique program, that little girl, um, mm-hmm. in, the, in the Matrix itself. Which asks a very, which, 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 which uh, uh, makes a very interesting point in terms of a, a lot of folks um, often wonder, what is my purpose? And a lot of folks mm-hmm. often see well and it's the naive bumper sticker theology god has a plan for this god has a purpose for this this all there's a reason for all of this and and it's sort of like i have to i have to i have to know myself as a person i have to know my value as a person in the purpose that god has created me for and what if the good news is is yes god created you god has no purpose for you and that's that's the beautiful thing that's yeah. good news because God, God loves you so much that God gave you the ability to choose your own purpose. Yeah. Well, and God, have you, have you seen the, have you seen the bumper sticker that is everything happens for a reason? Sometimes that reason is you're stupid and make bad choices. <laughs> <laughs> or my favorite, uh, Gail, uh, our colleague <clears throat> Gail, uh, 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 when, when God, whenever God, uh, uh, closes Dory, uh, he opens a window and, and now the heating bill is so high and there's animals in the house. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I think, isn't that a beautiful, in in a culture that tries to tell us that we have to have a purpose, that we have to be meaningful or produce something. It's really a beautiful thing to say, you know, we were created by someone who just likes creating. Yes. And who just takes joy in us. You know, when I think about that little girl, you know, what if the purpose is simply to cause joy and delight? The Shaker hymn, uh, the second verse that we often don't sing, uh, is uh, to sim- to to be at peace and simply be. Yeah. So and 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 yeah, the the exactly the sense of the the capitalist need for you to to fulfill your role, to do your job, and to earn your right to exist. You mm-hmm. only get to exist and to enjoy the needs of uh, the, the necessities of survival by earning it. Whereas mm-hmm. the gospel is that God created you, called you good. And yes, you are entitled to your basic needs. Yes, you are entitled to your basic needs because you have inherent value, not because of anything you do, but because God says you do. Because mm-hmm. God loves you and 
just want you to live and exist and be and have and enjoy Sabbath. Yeah. And after you've fulfilled that, we're going to either send you to exile or delete you. Yeah. So, Pastor, if you are uh, well, I, I, I directed this at Pastor Brown, but I, I, we all end, we always all end up answering the question, and, and there's so much more discussion that we have out of the question. So, pastors, if you were writing a sermon on this uh, 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 trilogy, what, what would the takeaway be for the congregation? Well, I actually have already used the Matrix as a centerpiece nice. of a sermon in my life before. Um, I did the sermon series on story types and how every story type that you have the, the basic, you know, fundamental 3000 foot view, uh, every story type points us back to the Bible and, and use the matrix as, as my primary example of a Christ story mm-hmm. um, that, you know, even, even in the sci-fi universe, we, we see the redemptive power of a story of, of, uh, of sacrifice and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, that, that uh, this, you know, one being fights for everyone type deal. Mm-hmm. And if I, if I was going to pick a new one, I'd probably go into that, that Christus Victor atonement theory mm-hmm. side of things. I think I would go with kind of what we've recently been talking about, you know, what is our purpose? Sometimes our purpose is simply to be and to love one another and to, soak in the experience of humanity you know i came that you might have life and life abundant what is life abundant this is salvation that you may know jesus christ whom god has sent and that's john 17 um so so the answer i I pose that as an answer to the question of what is life and life abundant but that's relational right this is salvation that you may have relationships with other beings yep. and come to know yourself in them and have them know themselves in you. So, yeah. That's probably where I go. Usually we almost end up I running. Don't know. Oh, go ahead. I, I don't know. And you may want to cut this and throw it beforehand, but what did you guys read in the first one? Um, what the, the, scene where he was being taken out of the matrix um did you read that as death baptism rebirth i read it as rebirth all of that in yeah i read it as rebirth and especially i like the question where you know he asks am i dead and morpheus says far from it you know and it, it, it there is baptismal elements to it but i imagine that's pretty much what birth would be would feel like you know, that, that you're coming out of this world that feels warm and comfortable and safe. And now you're in this cold, hard reality and everything's new and different and you're trying to figure it out. So. If you're going to the white light, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the ship comes as a big white light that they, they go into and yeah. And stuff, but yeah, I mean, they even call it being saved. I, I was reading baptism into it, but I was like, well, what's is this? Yeah. Death is this? You know, wh- where where is this? Uh, All of the above. <laughs> yeah. The in um, some sense, yeah. I mean, baptism is death in in some sense. Mm-hmm. Dying to the old way so that you can become a new life in Christ. Well, and we read salvation in. I mean, I to me the the the, the films proceed on a dialectical structure the the first film proposes a thesis the second film antithesizes the first film and then the uh, third film synthesizes the two um, but the um, first film we stick with the first film I mean it's clear that that moment represents a kind of salvation and we can make meaning out of it in the sense that salvation is painful it's joyful but it's painful because it's you know coming to mm-hmm. realize the truth of the lie that reality is not as you as you as you see it right and you know to me that when he awakens and sees himself plugged into the matrix and being unplugged from the matrix and and realizes holy crap this is what reality is like he's encountering the painful truth of the world of sin right um and in that sense you know that that is a salvific moment and and we can talk about we can read baptism and and all that into it but then the second film comes along and really just throws a wrench into the entire narrative as does the third film they they really just throw a wrench into the entire narrative 
of of soteriology that the first film really proposes that salvation is being unplugged from the matrix no it isn't no salvation is not being unplugged from the matrix and in, in a sense being unplugged from the matrix could be argued as a kind of damnation and 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 really um um Neo's role is not, at the end of the day, to free people from the Matrix, which asks some interesting questions about that kid who really like worships Neo because he was freed from the Matrix. Um, but Neo's role is not to free people from the Matrix. Neo's role is to make peace between the two worlds. So, And, you know, the love that Neo has for Trinity is what puts him on the path that isn't the path of the previous incarnations of the anomaly. You know, what, what prevent, what makes it so that he does not go back to the source is his love for Trinity, his need to, to go and to save her. And so really love is the, the wrench that gets thrown in the change that the Oracle makes is defining that love toward, toward Trinity, toward that one person that throws a wrench in, in the whole system that ultimately will lead to him being able to try to make that peace. Who uh, between, we... between the love and also Agent Smith, I think is not what has happened in previous ones, but. Um... What do we see is, uh, how do we read Trinity's character? Because the the only the only thing that comes to my mind and that and, and and I and I think it's entirely too simplistic, but it's what comes to my mind. So is Mary Magdalene, but um, at least as 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 folks ha have in recent years, of course, Luther thought this too, uh, proposed that Mary Magdalene and was Jesus's wife, which uh, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical of that. But uh, okay, what, what do we think? I think if you're picking a character from the gospel narrative that's the only one that really fits but um no i, I don't think that i i'm with you I, i'm skeptical of mary magdalene having a uh, significant sexual relationship but, i would with jesus perhaps romantic but but not well i would i i would i would say to those who are hyper orthodox of course i identify myself as an orthodox christian but i would say to those who are hyper orthodox i don't think there's a problem if 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 Mary Magdalene was had a sexual relationship with Jesus, there's no problem with that theologically. It's just I don't see to those who who who, who propose it, I, I see little evidence for it outside of the Gnostic Gospels, which are just later and and really of dubious historical value. Um, other than that, they provide a alternative way of looking at it. But no, no, I I, I see no evidence for it. Uh, but I, I don't see a problem it, it, with it either. It would not destroy my my faith in Christ, but there's no evidence in the can, canonical gospels <laughs> that I can see for it. But I, I'm struggling to find sort of a more um, um, philosophical understanding of, of of the character of Trinity, other than perhaps the every woman, uh, which is interesting because it subverts this this idea of the every man. The every man has to be a man, right? Well, in this case, the every woman is a woman. And it is God's lover, or it is the Christ's lover, which suggests a relationship with uh, our, our, our a relationship with God akin to the um, uh, uh, allegorical understanding of Song of Songs. I, I couldn't really find a, a biblical antidote to, to Trinity. I think it's just the she's that character that's there to uh, to represent the love to really be able to show show love on on the screen from Neo. Um, you could say something along the lines of she's the church if you're really wanting to stretch the metaphor, but, uh, you know, the church doesn't exist in the Gospels yet. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. Right. Do you have any ideas? Michelle? I mean, I, I think it, it's a hard one. I would say Magdalene is probably about the closest for Trinity. Um, of course, I think it's ironic that her name is Trinity. <laughs> Yeah, I was worried about that. <laughs> you know, so I think all the names are really fascinating. Like, and we've hit on some of that. So I think Mary Magdalene is an every woman in the Bible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. So, all right. Well, Michael, we are so excited that you were able to join us today for this conversation. Um, you're always welcome thanks as a friend of the me. show. Yeah. So thanks for joining the conversation and for your thoughts. Um, uh, 
And we, we thank all of our listeners, too, who have followed with us on this journey. And um, we want you to know there's a lot of ways that you can support what we do. Like, share, subscribe. If You can be a patron on our Patreon account at NFN. Um, and support us in that way. We will be launching an Indiegogo campaign before too long. We want you to check out all of our other New Faith, New Media podcasts as well, particularly Faith and What Resonates by the fabulous Gail Gallagher, who provides our music. And um, for those who are patron supporters, you can check out our Blessed Lunatics comedy roundtable, where we have kind of gotten away from comedy as such, but talk about some really interesting topics and have a good time doing it. So all of those things we ask you to join us and participate with, and we are so thankful to all of that. And of course, editor Wesley, who makes us sound much smarter than we probably are, which is saying a lot because we're pretty darn smart. But we are thankful to each and every one of you, and we wish you all happy viewing, and we'll see you in the theaters. What if I told you this podcast could be continued by you giving us money. We would like to thank the following people for participating in our Indiegogo campaign. Al Cole, Gail Gallagher, CJ Tor, Katie Overly, Susan LaBelle, Richard Bell, Laurie Morrison, Wesley Morrison Sloat, and Cameron Hood, as well as all of our donors who wish to remain anonymous. The New Faith New Media community is growing faster and stronger than we had ever dreamed it would, and we are looking forward to finding out what we can accomplish together.